Hello everyone! This video is a continuation upon my story of the Warcraft universe, the origin video. For those that missed it, in that video we talked about how the Warcraft universe came to be, what the Titans did with their time, and how Sargeras realized that he had to destroy the universe in order to prevent the Void from conquering it. The Pantheon tried to make their champion see reason, but it was already far too late, and as Sargeras went to form his burning legion, the Pantheon continued their mission of bringing order to the planets and fighting more nascent titans. Let's begin, shall we? For many years, the Pantheon continued searching for more of their kin, titan souls to wake from their slumber. Yet despite their efforts, they found none. At times, the Pantheon wondered if their search was in vain, but always they pressed on, knowing deep in their hearts that more world souls did exist, and the Pantheon would be proven right. In the far corners of the Great Dark, a world took form with a titan soul inside, a world we now call Azeroth. Upon the surface of the planet, elemental spirits walked free. You had air, fire, water and earth. Yet the fifth element, the element of spirit, it had been drawn in and almost consumed entirely by the growing titan spirits. Without this primordial force to create balance, Azeroth's elemental spirits fell into chaos and they were led by four elemental lords, powerful beyond mortal comprehension. There was Alakir the Wind Lord, ruthlessly cunning, Ragnaros the Fire Lord, compulsive and brash, Ferris Zane the Stone Mother, reclusive and protective, and then finally the wise Neptulon the Tidehunter. These four elements raged war with each other, each in turn trying to gain dominion over Azeroth, but victory was not the main goal here. The endless cycle of chaos was what the elements enjoyed most, and for a time the world was their playground, that is, until the arrival of the Old Gods. Sent by the Void Lords to infect and corrupt planets in the hopes of hitting the jackpot and corrupting its Titan spirits. These old gods, Yashirash, Yaxaron, Kafun, and Nazoth, they slammed into Azra's surface, tendrils burrowing deep into the world crust towards the defenseless heart of Azeroth. Organic matter seeped from the old gods' blighted forms, giving birth to two distinct races. One of them was the cunning and intelligent Naraki, also known as the Phasers ones, whereas the second race was the Akir, insectoids of incredible resilience and strength. The Naraki acted as ruthless taskmasters, putting the Akir to work to build towering citadels and temple cities around their master's colossal bodies. The greatest of these bastions, it was built around Yashiraj, the most powerful and wicked of the old gods. Before long, the Black Empire would rise and it took control over Azeroth, and of course, this did not go unnoticed by the Elemental Lords. For the first time in Azeroth's history, the Elemental Lords worked together, rather than against each other. Fire, wind, earth and water, it was all tossed at the minions of the old gods. The elements did incredible damage to their numbers, but it simply wasn't enough. No matter how many of the Inraki and the Akir died, more and more spawned from the old gods form like larvae from a hive, and in the end, the elementals were enslaved by the old gods. Twilight descended upon Azeroth, and the world spiraled into an abyss of suffering and death. In the meantime, in the depths of the great dark beyond, Agramar continued his mission of eradicating all signs of demonic influence. His battles took him from one world to the other, until he sensed the tranquil dreams of a slumbering world soul. He made his way to this world, only to discover that Sargeras had been right about the Void Lords and their plans. The planet had been infected, but Agramar believed that the world was not beyond saving. He quickly made his way back to the Pantheon and convinced them to join him in his mission of cleansing the planet. The spirit he had sensed inside the planet, it was mighty, possibly even more powerful than Sargeras, and if it was brought to maturity, it could be a great ally against the Void. On top of that, the Titan spirit was one of their own, it was family, so they had to do everything in their power to save it. For this, Agramar had a bold plan of attack. All members of the Pantheon, they would travel to Azeroth and purge the Black Empire that had claimed it. They would not take action directly, since they feared that their colossal forms and their colossal power, it would do too much damage to the planet, perhaps even kill the world soul inside. So instead, he proposed that they would create mighty constructs to do the fighting for them. Under the guidance of the great forger Kaskarov, they crafted an army of enormous servants from the very crust of Azeroth itself. Titan forged Aesir and Vanir, whereas the Aesir were made out of metal and would command the power of storms, Vanir were made out of stone and they would hold the power over earth. 
To lead these Titan Forged, the members of the Pantheon also created keepers with their specific likenesses and powers. Aman Fool gifted some of his vast abilities to High Keeper Ra and Keeper Odin. Kaskarov bestowed his mastery over the earth and forging to Keeper Arcadis. Golganeth granted Keeper Forim and Hodir dominion over the storms and skies. Eonar gave Keeper Freya command over Azor's flora and fauna. Norganon lent a portion of his intellect and mastery of magic to Keepers Loken and Mimiron. And lastly, Agramar impaired his strength and courage to Keeper Tyr, who would become the greatest warrior of the Titan Forged. With this new army molded from the world's crust, the Pantheon went to war against the Black Empire. Led by the Keepers, the Titan Forge slammed into the Black Empire, and in response, the Old Gods called upon the greatest lieutenants, the enslaved Elemental Lords. The Keepers were smart enough to realize that they had to avoid fighting the unified elements, so they decided on a divide and conquer strategy. Strategy. Tyr and Odin, they confronted Ragnaros the Fire Lord, their metal bodies keeping them safe from the fiery onslaughts. Arcadis and Freya, they took on Ferrazane, using the dominion over Earth, the flora and fauna against her. Ra, Forim and Hodir, they fought with Alakir, using their mastery over the skies and storms, turning the Elemental Lord's own power against him. Then there was Neptulon, who was wise, and he tried to assist his fellow Elemental Lords, yet Loken and Mimiron, they used their wits to outmaneuver him at every turn. With the use of their arcane power and enchanted bonds, they were able to overcome the Lord of Water. The battles were furious, raged on for many weeks, yet in the end, the Elemental Lords were defeated. The Keepers, they knew that they could not simply slay the Elemental Lords, since they were bound to Azeroth and would simply return over time. Keeper Ra followed Sargeras' example with the demons, and he decided that instead of slaying the Elemental Lords, they should create a prison for the elements. He requested the aid of Helia, a gifted Titan Forge sorceress, and together they worked on creating four interlinked domains within in a pocket dimension called the Elemental Plane. This would be their enchanted prison realm. Ragnaros and his minions, they were placed within the Firelands, Ferrazane in Deepholm, Neptulon in the Abyssal Maw, and Elakir was placed within Skywall. With the greatest lieutenants, the old gods had to send them out of the way. The Keepers continued the war against the Black Empire, and the next target was the Akir. Arcadis bent the stone and soil to his will. He collapsed the Akiri burrows on top of them, and this drove the Insectoids above ground. There, the Titan Forge army waited for them to slaughter them all, yet small pockets of these insectoids, even though they were too weak to mount a counterattack, they were able to escape the Keeper's Wrath by burying further underground. The victories over the Elemental Lords and the Akir encouraged the Keepers, but they knew full well that the greatest battles were still ahead of them. They turned their attention on the temple city built around the old god Yashiraj. He was indeed extremely powerful, more so than the Keepers had expected. He was able to poison the mind of the Titan Forge. He drew out their fears and darkened their thoughts. I can taste the essence of your soul. The battle became so dire that the Pantheon feared that the old gods would overwhelm their servants. Despite the better judgments, Amon Fool himself, he reached down through Azeroth's stormy skies and he ripped Yashiraj out of the planet. In that moment, Yashiraj was ripped apart, his death rattle shattered mountaintops and obliterated hundreds of the titan forts where they stood. His tendrils had burrowed so deep within Azeroth that volatile arcane energies, the lifeblood of the nascent titan, it erupted from the scar left behind. In this moment, the titans understood that they could not risk killing any of the other old gods. The old gods had emptied themselves so deep within the planet that tearing them out would destroy Azeroth itself. Instead, Imprisoning once again seemed to be a much better solution. The Titan Forge, they battled with the old gods, and upon defeat, Arcadis created a subterranean chamber to contain them. Mimiron created colossal machines to lock the old gods in place, while Loken would enchant each prison to neutralize the old gods' evil. Nazoth and Kafoon fell to their might and were imprisoned, yet Yaxaran would not fall so easily. He unleashed the greatest of his generals, the Kafraxi, monstrous warbringers, larger and far more resilient than any other of the Naraki. They possessed great strength and intellect, their dark power could drive even the Titan Forge to madness, and at the crack of their whip, 
the Romani Black Empire was sent into a frenzy. They assaulted the Titan Force on all sides, thinning their ranks, and by the time that the Keepers reached Yaxaron, their force had greatly diminished. They no longer had the strength or numbers to complete their mission, but Titan Keeper Odin, he was not about to give up. He summoned his waning strength, inspired them all to launch a counterattack. Loken was commanded to weave a Grand Illusion spell that forced the Kafraxi to see themselves and even their creation creator Yaxaran as the enemy. With the Black Empire turned upon itself, the Titan Forge moved in for the kill. As they had done with Kafun and Azov, the Keepers buried Yaxaran beneath the earth, locking it away in an enchanted prison. For the first time in Azeroth's history, a sense of peace settled over the world, but there was still much work to be done. They might have saved the planet, but the Titan spirit inside could use all the help it could get if it was to grow and mature, not to mention that the gigantic scar left behind when Yashiraj was pulled out, they had some ordering to do. To help them with their mission, the Pantheon gave artifacts to the Keepers, known as Pillars of Creation. Now their first priority was doing something about that massive wound on the planet, since they knew that the energies pouring out of it, it would sooner or later consume Azeroth. They labored day and night, they crafted magical wards around the gaping wound, until eventually the energies calmed down and settled into balance. All that remained of the scar was a gigantic lake of energy that the keepers would call the Well of Eternity. With that immediate threat out of the way, they worked on strengthening the nascent world soul and stabilize its life force. For this, Arcadus and Mimiron, they combined the power to craft the Forge of Wills and the Forge of Origination. These two machines would work together and together they would infuse Azeroth's spirits with cosmic energies. The Forge of Wills was placed in the northern parts of the world and it would shape the world soul's early thoughts and perception. The Forge of Origination was placed in the southern area of Azeroth and it would control the rhythm of the deep earth and fortify the world soul's form. With these two machines created, the Keepers continued the work with Odin overseeing the events with the Forge of Wills. The Pantheon recognized his heroic deeds during the War of the Old Gods, so they appointed him as the Prime Designate. The duty of watching over Yaxaran's prison and maintaining the Forge of Wills, that would fall onto him. Now Odin and the other Keepers, they began building the Great Fortress of Ulduar to serve as a main bastion of the Titan Forge on Azeroth. It would contain not only Yaxaran's prison, but also the Forge of Wills and any other machines created by the Keepers. Besides the purpose of shaping the world's soul, the Forge of Wills had another use, which was to create a whole new generation of the Titan Forge. No longer just giants, now they also created the Anubisov, the Tolvir and the Mogu. These beings shaped from stone and metal, they would help the Keepers bring order to the world. As the Forge of Wills under Odin's command did its thing in Northrend, Ra led an expedition to install the Forge of Origination in the south. With him came a bunch of the new Titan Forged, and as they traveled, they found some of the remnants of Yashiraj. When Amanful pulled him out of the world, some of his body parts fell back onto the planet, and even that was enough to infuse the land with evil. The largest chunk that remained was the old god's heart, and Ra figured that placing it within a container and guarding it, it would be the best course of action, since studying it could help them decipher the nature of the old gods and other creatures of the void. Ra told some of his Mogu followers to watch over the vault of Yashiraj while also taking care of the surrounding land. The expedition west carried on and there they placed the Forge of Origination in the land. The machines were working together just as they had planned, sending healing energies through the heart of the world. A big fortress around the Forge of Origination was built by Ra and his followers, which they called Uldum, and it would become the most sovereign base of operations for the Keepers. Similar to the Forge of Wills, besides fortifying the world World soul, this machine had another purpose. In case the world would fall to corruption once again, this machine could be used to unleash incredible energies. Energies powerful enough to eradicate all life on the planet and have it start all over again. Some of the Tolvir and the Anubisaf, they were left behind to safeguard Uldum, while the rest of the party they marched northwest into the lands called Silifus, home to Kafun's prison. Ra and his allies, they worked on expanding this prison, building another mighty fortress and this one they called Ankiraj. With the task complete, High Keeper Ra ordered the remaining Titan Forge to stay behind and guard the strongholds. He himself roamed the southern regions of Azeroth, observing his Titan Forge from a distance and making sure that they performed their duties.
With their machines placed upon the planet, the next job the keepers had was reshaping the land. For this, they had their new generation of servants created from the Forge of Wheels, each of them having their own job to perform. There were the Irvin, specialized in crafting mountains and carving out the deep places of the world. The Mechanomes, designed by Keeper Mimaron, charged with building and maintaining the keeper's machineries. The Mogu, to dig out the rivers and waterways of Azeroth stone and sea giants to shape the environment, and to guard all of it, they had two different groups of constructs, the Vrykul and the Tolvir. These creations would walk over the land of Azeroth and shape it to their image. But where there is a world, there is a need for life. This duty fell upon Keeper Freya, and in order to bring about life, she crafted, or she tapped into, a realm called the Emerald Dream. Spirits and strange otherworldly beings populated the dream, a surreal paradise, a mirror image of Azeroth. With that realm created, or that link established, Freya wandered the world, searching for locations where the Well of Eternity's energies had come together. She had found that these locations created the perfect conditions to develop new flora and fauna, places like Unguro Crater, Sholazar Basin, and the Veil of Eternal Blossoms. She experimented and molded life of astounding diversity, and she seeded it all around the world. The greatest creatures to come out of these areas were the colossal animals, known in the past as the demigods, and now we call them wild gods. Freya loved and adored these wild gods as if they were her own children. They often wandered the land together, forests and grasslands blooming in their footsteps, yet there was one place that she and the wild gods visited more than any other. A massive forested peak called Mount Hyjal. It was on the slopes of Hyjal that Freya bound the spirits of her beloved wild gods to the Emerald Dream. Now you might remember seeing a few of them in the past, like Aviana, Ursak and Goldrin. Those are a few examples of the wild gods. As they continued their journey, they found life forms not directly created by Freya or the other keepers. When they banished Azeroth's elementals to the elemental plane, some had escaped the banishment and they evolved into something new, new creatures of flesh and blood. A prime example of these were the proto-dragons, which means that not all life on Azeroth was shaped by the Keeper's hands. Over time, the Keepers and their servants, they were able to form, shape, stabilize and create Azeroth's main landmass, a continent full of plants and creatures of every kind. Twilight fell as the Titan Forge surveyed the world that they had shaped, and they named the primary continent Kalimdor, Land of Eternal Starlight. The Titans were very happy with the Keeper's work, and they knew that the slumbering world soul was in good hands. It was time to travel back into the Great Dark to search for more of their kind, but the discovery of Azeroth, it had shown them that there could be more of them out there. The Keepers left behind were sad that their creators had to go, yet they were also filled with pride at being given the honor of safeguarding Azeroth. Loken and Mimiron, they crafted a set of enchanted artifacts called the Discs of Norganon, which would be used to keep a record of the history unfolding on Azeroth. Should the Pantheon ever return to the planet, then they would know what happened in their absence. As a final act, before leaving Azeroth behind, Amon Fool recruited Elgolan the Observer to serve as the world's celestial guardian. He would keep an eye on things, make sure that the planet would not fall to corruption once again, and if there was the need, he could activate a protocol, turning the Forge of Origination into a weapon, which would then purge the world of all life and corruption. The Titans had done everything possible to heal Azeroth and bring the world soul to be. All that remained now was to wait, wait and hope that the world soul would one day awaken. They said their final farewells, went about their journey, and this would be the last time that the Keepers would see their creators. But that's the story for another day, since I've been going on for long enough. As a final note, if we compare this storyline to the previously established story, then we can see that a lot of things in the past credited to the Titans, they were actually done in order of the Titans by their Titan Keepers and the Titan Forge. We finally know how and why the Well of Eternity came to be, and an interesting change is that instead of the entire land being called Kalimdor, now they said that the primary continent was named Kalimdor. Does that mean that there was another continent, maybe multiple? Is there still another side of Azeroth that we need to explore? Maybe, but only time will tell. For now, we've reached the end of the video. Next week, I want to talk about the events that took place once the Titans left Azeroth behind, left their keepers to do its thing. Some familiar with the old lore you might have already picked up on Odin, 
being assigned as the Prime Designate, yet the story told during Wrath of the Lich King, it told us that Loken was the Prime Designate. There is a reason for that, and there is so much more to talk about, which I can't wait to do. But, as always, thank you very much for watching, everyone. Subscribe if you like my videos, and until next time, guys, see ya!